Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. We're not quite ready to start yet. A few more minutes. I've got a lot more people joining up. So, Michael Jordan, it's good to see you. Yeah, this should be fun. I have a lot of information. A lot of people tuning in. I I enjoy Albert a lot, man. And in fact, we, we usually pass a bottle of mead back and forth when we see each other. And I was really happy one time when I hate to say it, he, he got in a huge car accident here and I was happy and fortunate to help out a fellow beekeeper and help him out and help him get his vehicle to location and kind of get him so he could get going the next round. So it was good to it's always good to help out your fellow man and your fellow beekeeper. So yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be really good. It's always good to hear from you, Mike. Yeah, you kept busy. I like, uh, I liked when you came through the last time with all your trinkets and artifacts from your journeys, man, that uh, you get to have some pretty exotic and elaborate journeys beekeeping. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, all of it has been shut down for the last year, though. Looks yeah, like it's definitely hindered some. Yeah, it's definitely hindered beekeeping classes and and actually getting to see what what people are really doing. I I had a lot of people that graduated some of my classes and I'd like to see some of their work. But you can't you can't go. Well, I don't know if I want to fly. <laughs> I think that's my problem. I just don't want to fly right now. Pretty cold there in Cheyenne. Uh, we got a little snow. It's uh, it's been skipped in a little bit of snow. It's like I'm sure they're getting more east of us, but we're getting little skips. Today in Saskatoon, it was minus 28, and with the wind chill, minus 38. Bitter, bitter, bitter day. Had to throw up a little hello. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the University of Wyoming Laramie County Extension's modified Wyoming Bee College Conference series. <laughs> so I'm going to be running a series of these programs on beekeeping. Um, all through February and then in March. And then in March, I'll have one day, um, March 20th, so mark your calendar. So for all the beginning beekeepers, I'm bringing Dr. Carolina Nayardi back, who is, she is an amazing instructor and just one of the best beginning basic beekeeping people I've ever run into. But tonight's program, um, <laughs> I've brought Albert Chubach back and one of my favorite speakers, always, always delightful to talk to him about bees and life in general. He is living in Saskatoon, where it's bitterly cold, and it is cold here and snowy, but not like Saskatoon. I uh, still have people joining up here, so it's going to be a big class for you, Albert. So Albert has taken the time and effort to really carefully observe and scrutinize what the bees do. And, and up until now, we figured there was maybe like seven different jobs that the bees were doing. But we've, but talking to Albert and, and listening to what he's got to say, 
there apparently is a lot more things that the bees do that we're not aware of, but he has observed. So he's going to share what he has observed and learned with us tonight. So this is really not a um, how to beekeeping, but a how to understand your bees and how to understand what's going on in that beehive so that you can maybe work with the bees a little bit better, understand what's going on there. So tonight, if you have questions, by all means, there's a chat box down at the bottom and I will monitor that. So if you've got a question for Albert or just a beekeeping question in general, go ahead and put that in down there or you can, you can raise your hand and there's a little um, on the bottom of the toolbar there, there's a little smiley face says reactions. So just go ahead and click that and raise your hand. And so we can carry on a conversation. And by all means, um, keep your video running. We're trying to be a little bit more social and a little more visiting with everybody, get to see people because <laughs> doing it this way is, is difficult. And I certainly miss doing the B college and seeing everybody. So um, I, I think that's all the rules I have is if you have a question, ask. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to tonight's co-host, Albert Chubach, who has been building bee beautiful beehives and looking at different ways of keeping bees. And has been one of my, my perennial speakers at the Wyoming Bee College. So Albert, go ahead, it's all yours. Hi there, I'm in cold Saskatoon. It's uh, minus 28 today with a wind chill of minus 38. Uh, so I had the chance to just stay in all day and work on PowerPoint uh, much better than going outside. Uh, the PowerPoint that we're gonna look at today is a project that I started uh, earlier this year because we were all closed in up here. And it's on all the rules that are performed by the bees. Now, we know that there's a lot of different things that they do, but typically when I ask, people can list five to eight different things and that's about all. To me, uh, I discovered a lot. And in doing that, uh, I decided that I would do a book and the book would be focused to younger kids and uh, Catherine gave me the opportunity to share some of it here today you're going to get the first glimpse of what I've been working on all year. Uh, it should be done, uh, I would think, sometime mid-year this year. And all of the stuff is pretty much original works of art. Uh, you'll have a, a kick out of it. So I'm going to bring up the PowerPoint. And we'll go from there. Can everybody see it? Does it look good? Looks good, speak, Albert. Do you speak honeybee? Learning the duties of the honeybee. Let's see, there we go. My project for 2021 uh, had a focus of trying to figure out how to teach kids 12 and older, but it could be a little bit younger and there's gonna be people that are gonna be uh, considerably old that will enjoy it too. Uh, bee anatomy compared to traits. I've got to move something here. Uh, compared to traits of a superhero, hero, uh, teaching bee behavior with hats, uh, uh, colony role identification, figuring out what's going on and when, uh, a colony compared to a large city, because that's what each colony is. Uh, if you do this, this will be the result. It's what I refer to as the if-then principle in beekeeping. A lot of us just sit and wait for something to happen and we try to modify it after that. But I believe that there's a lot of absolutes in beekeeping. If you do this, this will result. And then uh, the last part will be honey and hive uh, games and projects. So that's kind of what I'm working on. It's gonna be a, a full book, be color, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So many beekeepers ask, why is this happening to my colony? 
And what can I do to fix it? If we could just speak their language, how many people have thought of that? Do your bees speak to you? And actually they do. There's a class that I taught years ago about reading a frame. When you pull out a frame from a beehive, you can look at it and the bees are actually talking to you. They're talking to you in images, but language of a bee consists of scent, movement, temperature and variation, temperature variation, individual and group actions, and then you can find it in their work projects. Uh, it also is shown, uh, believe it or not, after they die through appearance and location after death. That's how a bee communicates with us. Um, they don't have, they don't talk. They can't verbally tell you things, but they tell you it through this. And this is how they communicate with each other. And through some of these, you can actually find out what's going on. Scent is a big one. You can actually smell issues in the hive, but that's the language of the bee. Understanding bee anatomy. A honeybee is an insect superhero with special qualities and skills like Superman, Iron Man, Batgirl, Electra, Guardians of the Galaxy, and on and on. Honeybees have special skills and talents. It's just a matter of finding out and realizing what they are. Name some unique traits that a honeybee has. Start thinking in your mind, what are some of the unique things that a honeybee has as gifts and skills and traits? Well, first off, their abdomen, they breathe through it. Most of us just automatically think you have to breathe through your mouth. They don't, they breathe through their abdomen. So if you have a bee that gets soaked with water, what will happen to it? it? Can drown because their hair and their abdomen prevents them from breathing. Antenna, we always think that they're maybe feeling the air. Um, they're used for smelling. That's what antenna is for. Uh, armor, they have lightweight hardened exoskeleton called chitin. Um, brain processor and ganglia. Bees have seven or have a main brain, but they have several uh, other things called ganglia. So there's times where you'll see a bee and its head could be cut off. Their antenna is moving. It seems like the head is alive, but it's detached. And then you'll look at their body and their body is actually standing there. They're grooming themselves, yet it's completely detached from each other. That's the ganglia. Uh, it allows different areas of the body uh, to continue to function. Uh, bee school. There isn't a bee school, but much of what a bee does is found in their DNA. Breathes through their abdomen. That's similar to the uh, abdomen earlier. Their coat. They have a fur coat on their thorax and a little bit less so on their abdomen. Uh, communication, they communicate through movement, heat, scent, rather than audible. Eyes, they have a thousand eyes, thousand lens, lenses covered with hairs, and ability to see ultraviolet spectrum of light. They can see the sun through the clouds. They can see your breath. Uh, so where do you think you usually get stung when you get stung by a bee? Somewhere around here is usually where you get stung. Feet, they have a multifaceted way to walk with suction cups, hooks and claws. Uh, they can walk on glass upside down. Uh, they can walk on cloth. Um, it's really an amazing uh, foot. GPS, they have an internal natural GPS locator finding their way home from foraging. There's a uh, saying, uh, bee lining it, uh, bee line, once a bee is full of whatever it's getting, it could be nectar, it could be a pollen resource, it could be propolis, it could be whatever. Once they're full, they beeline at home. They go the fastest, straightest line from where they were home. How they do that is an internal GPS mechanism that they have, where they can go straight home. Grooming combs, they have grooming hardware as a part of their exoskeleton. They have a number of them. 
head. The front of the bee is, and one of its three bodies, okay, the head is the front of the bee. And it's one of three body sections. It has eyes, mandibles, which is their jaw. They can chew an antenna. It is the information headquarters for the bee. Internal storage and stomach. The bee has internal storage tanks for their honey stack and collecting liquid, as well as one that's a pit gut for digesting food. So there's people that will say, oh, honey is barf, bee barf. Well, no, that was out of their uh, honey sack, not out of their gut. Uh, their mid gut is what they digest food with and the honey sack is for collecting. Legs. Bees have six segmented legs equipped with pollen baskets and antenna combs. Mandibles are like uh, jaw-like and used for cutting, grasping, and squeezing. Um, I sometimes put comb on frames in my hive and uh, attach it with uh, elastic bands. The bees can actually chew through elastic bands and then haul out with their uh, jaws and their hands those elastic bands. You know, I'm going to add a story to this. Years ago, I sold a frame of uh, brood to a, a lady and it had stuff on it, but it had an elastic band. Well, I get this uh, message in the mail, uh, email saying that uh, the bees that I sent her had worms in it. And I asked, what do you mean worms? She said, yeah, there's a big long worm. She sent me a picture and there was this big long flesh looking thing on the front of this hive. When I looked closer, it was an elastic band. It wasn't a worm, she got it wrong, but the bees actually have a lot of fun pulling out elastic bands out of your hive. Ocelli are three intensity eyes. They're uh, used for determining light intensity. Uh, pollen baskets, an area on their hind legs with hair that is wet and that can hold wet and sticky pollen and propolis ingredients, proboscis, a tongue-like tool that can extend a quarter of an inch and can suck like a straw, as well as lick. Uh, a close-up uh, image of a proboscis is amazing. Smell, an acute sense of smell greater than a dog. A honeybee smells with it at its antenna. They now have found that uh, honeybees can actually smell cancer cells. Stinger, a defensive weapon, doesn't kill, it's a defensive weapon, at the tip of the abdomen, uh, only in female bees, including the queen. Once used, it emits an alarm pheromone uh, or scent alerting other defense bees. Thorax, the middle section of the bee with four wings, six legs is seen uh, as the engine as it creates energy. Note that it has four wings. So if you see something going in and out of your hive that has uh, two wings, it's not a honeybee, um, not to mention the colors. So that wings has four delicate wings capable of traveling great distances. So those are some of their gifts that they have um, of which we as beekeepers need to understand. Each skill or ability the bee has helps them with special needs. Understanding these traits helps the beekeeper, beekeeper assist the bees. What hats do bees wear? Oh, by the way, anybody that has questions all the way through, feel free to ask. I like to answer questions as well. So what hats do bees wear? Understanding honeybees begins with one, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? When are they doing it? And how are they doing it? That's kind of the key with understanding uh, a lot about what's going on with bees. Many roles exist for honeybees. What hats do you know of? So think in your mind of what jobs honeybees uh, perform in the hive. There's gonna be some that we're gonna bring up here that you're gonna think, well, yeah, duh, but I never thought of it. So, what do you think this is? It's washboarding on the front of the hive. Uh, they're dancing. They do it as a, a social activity. Next one, it's a chemist. Next, 
That's a worker bee. Next, dock worker. Next, air defense. Next, mobile food service. They have mobile food service. Robber bee, tenant to the queen. So those are some of the images that we have. I have 50 of these. And each one of them will have detail, of which we're gonna go over some in a minute. Roles found in a colony. These are some of the things, these are the list of items that I've found. Adopted workers and queens, even within a bee colony, there are adopted bees that have come from another colony. And we mostly use adopted queens in the beginning of the year. We add a queen to a package. So adopted workers and the queens. There's bee drift. There's all sorts of ways for uh, bees to get attached to another colony. But adoption, it happens in the bee world. Attendance to the queen. Those that are right immediately around the queen, helping her with everything. Baggage handlers, those at the front that uh, are taking stuff that is being brought in and they're moving along, such as pollen. The bee that brings in the pollen can't take the pollen off their legs. Uh, they need other bees to help with that, baggage handlers. Cell cappers, those that cap off the cells either to, uh, with honey or with babies in the brood chamber. Cell inspector, um, once a baby has been laid in a cell, it can be visited up to 10,000 times. Um, I've heard 3,500 times a day, but I've also heard up to 10,000 times. So there's cell inspectors where they're checking what's going on in the bee world within that cell. Chemists, they make propolis out of ingredients from all over the place. Uh, they get, uh, and that's also their medicine. Uh, it, you have honey that is mixed with stuff. Bee bread, this mixed with, so they have a chemist. Child care worker, taking care of the uh, larva and such, and the small bees that are about to come out of the cells. Disaster cleanup. This crew comes out every time after you inspect your colony. Believe it or not, when you leave, their disaster cleanup crew comes out to repair the things that you've done. Dock workers. Those are the ones right in the front entrance of the hive that are waiting for a job. Drone bee, that's the male. Festooning or scaffolding bee. Uh, when there's an area in a hive or well, inside the hive that uh, is open, they'll festoon or hang uh, hand to foot and allow other bees to walk across them to build the comb and that uh, festooning gets replaced with uh, honey or with comb. Fighting bugling queens. Uh, and they actually make a noise. It's a little chirp that you hear when you walk around the hive. If there's multiple queens in a hive, you'll hear bugling, you'll hear chirps. And that's the queens announcing to the rest of the colony that they're going to battle. It's a cage fight. Foraging bee or field bee. That's the bee that's off uh, picking up uh, resources, bringing it home. Glure bee or propolis smearing. Uh, those are ones that are filling in cracks and holes and disinfecting the hive, making it so that it's all safe. Guard bee or military bee. Uh, those are ones that you'll see flying around that uh, when you're around the hive and something's going on and you hear the bees, the pitch go up higher, uh, it's the military bees then, they're in active duty. Garbage removal. Uh, there's bees that actually go through the hive and either toss the stuff to the bottom or they clean it out like the elastic bands or they haul it away. Now, see, this is just one column. There's, there's lots of them. Gatekeepers, when bees come in that aren't from that colony, they have the wrong smell, gatekeepers check them at the door. General executioner, uh, there's some that uh, are not supposed to be from that colony that get executed in the hive. Uh, heater bees providing heat uh, during cluster times of cold, maintaining it. Nectar cooks. Uh, when nectar comes in from a plant, uh, it's sweet water and the bees heat it up and dehydrate it to become honey. House bee or housekeeping bee, they're cleaning everything up, making it really nice. 
HVAC. They're the ones that regulate the temperature, humidity, uh, so that and moisture in the hive and such, so that thing, if the humidity gets too low, all your eggs will die. If the heat gets too high, your bees will die. So there's HVAC specialists, hygienic groomers uh, that care for each other. That's not in every hive, but uh, they do uh, groom themselves. Uh, queen wannabes are laying workers. That's when the colony goes uh, for uh, 20 days without a queen, they create a laying worker. Line dancers, that's the uh, uh, bees on the front of the hive during, it's after a period of uh, nectar flow. Uh, you'll see um, on the front of your hive, a whole bunch of bees and they're all moving together at the same time. It's called washboarding. Those are line dancers. Uh, map quests or GPSB, we talked about that a little bit ago. Uh, military Air Patrol, Military National Guard veteran, those are the ones that have stung and they're missing their stinger. Uh, mobile, uh, mobile lunch distribution services. Well, bees are festooning and doing other things in the hive. Uh, they're unable to go and get their snacks or get their food. So there's other bees that come along and feed them. Movers specialize in product relocation. Sometimes when things happen in the hive, you put something in the wrong place, you inspect it, change it. The bees go through and they relocate product uh, in the hive to be in a better location. Uh, I've seen whole frames emptied and things move to a different place. Pollen bee bread bangers. Uh, pollen is their source of protein and they bang it and they ferment it. Queen bee, resource meshes, message carriers and waggle dancers. Waggle dancers are bringing in a message and they're sharing it to the colony. It could be a source of food. It could be a place that they're uh, considering moving to. They bring in messages, whether there's something going on, uh, they're waggle dancers. Robbers, robbers, uh, can be from your hive, they can be from other hives, they can be from other species. Royal excrement handler, believe it or not, the queen doesn't go on cleansing flights like all the other bees can. And so there's bees there that clean up after her. So that's the royal excrement handler. Royal executioners, sometimes you see bees get bald and you'll find a dead queen in the front of your hive. Royal jelly producers, that's their, uh, uh, it's made from protein, it's needed for young, it's needed for the queen. Swarming scouts, where they're looking for a new home uh, and messages. Undertakers, uh, where they're hauling off the dead. Many people have seen that, where you see a bee flying off with another dead bee on it. Ventilator bee and lighthouse bee, where they're fanning uh, a scent or a smell away from the hive to help uh, bees from that colony find home. Wax producer or chewer. Uh, once the wax is produced, they got to chew it up, deform it like using clay, worker bee, and more roles exist. So there's lots of roles going on in your hive. And the fun thing is when you're looking at a frame or looking at your hive, trying to determine what job is being performed by those bees. And um, once you know what's going on, whether it's reading a frame or reading what's going on at your hive, these are fun. And believe it or not, a lot of these, you can actually induce, you can create that job to happen. So here's one, he's, he's the bee veteran. Uh, you can see that he's missing his stinger. He's gone through a battle. And so in my book, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have each one of the jobs of the bee, and we're gonna have details of what it does, where you can find it, what it looks like in reality, uh, so that if somebody comes and looks, they can actually see where each one of those jobs are and how to find it. So this one, loss of stinger, the parents, missing body parts, it could be other issues with the bee, uh, cause, defense of an intruder, uh, age, roughly four to six weeks old, 
where to find inside or outside of the hive, uh, sex type that's female, defensive quality, it deters the intruder. It isn't meant to kill it, it's to just deter it. Effects, uh, increased aggression from nearby bees because it's emitting a uh, alarm pheromone. It doesn't increase the aggression of the entire colony, just nearby bees, uh, other uh, defense bees. Buzzing sound has an increased pitch, uh, release of venom, uh, the venom gland, it's a liquid, and mandibular gland, which is alarm scent. Result, offers protection to the colony, and it's fatal for that bee. There's usually about 300 or more defense bees uh, patrolling around a full-size hive. Uh, replacement occurs continually as needed. Color, it's the same as any other bee in the colony. Maybe hairless and black, because that would be more of a robber bee. Uh, weapon characteristics, the weapon is barbed. Uh, there's the length. It's used one time and then it's removed. Uh, this is Exe the Defender. That's her name. Uh, each one of these has a name. I thought it kind of fun coming up with them. And so as we go through these several that are here, each one of them will have a name and I kind of enjoyed them. Next one is uh, Savannah the Scout. Hey, um, Albert. Yep. Before you get going too far, a couple questions. So on the veteran guard bee, where she's lost her stinger, you know, the, the assumption has always been that they die right away, but that's kind of a, a false assumption, isn't it? Yeah, it's about an hour. Um, I haven't waited around to watch, uh, but I'm told it takes them about an hour to die. Uh, after they uh, lose their stinger, you'll see them walking and grooming and almost as if it didn't even happen. But uh, normally when the stinger is pulled out, their intestines and guts are pulled out too. So there's no way that that bee can live without their stinger. There's times where the stinger will scratch your skin and you'll uh, get, you'll have a mark, you can see it, but because the stinger didn't penetrate, the pen, uh, stinger is still in the bee, thus it's still, that bee is still okay. There's other things like, um, there is venom extractors where the bees will sting the venom extractor and release the venom but it doesn't kill the bee. Um, but being it's barbed, if it gets into the skin, it loses it. Okay. And then all these jobs that you described at the beginning, uh -huh. that, that, that big, huge list, that amazing list, do the bees rotate through the job or is it an age-related thing? It's, it's age-related in most cases, but they can be uh, induced to go back to a previous stage. And that's where it's really kind of fun, uh, depending on what you do to the colony and uh, how the colony has been changed will depend on whether they can revert back to a previous uh, role. So just because that they're now a, a forging bee, they don't have to always stay a forging bee. If you take a couple frames and move it into another hive to start a nuke, you just created a big change and their job functions and roles all change. And uh, they can be reverted back to prior roles. More questions? Not at the moment. You're doing a great job. Keep on. That's so pretty here's, amazing. Here's the messenger scout bee, Savannah the scout. Um, each one of these little images have things in them uh, that we kind of put for people to try and catch. I like the fact that the images have uh, the two, two claws. They are segmented the way they're supposed to be. Um, this one doesn't seem to have anything hidden, but there's some of them that we have that do. Uh, so a messenger, a scalpy, it can be, can have any honeybee coloring. Uh, they carry messages. Uh, they're vital to the colony. Um, it's almost like the uh, dove or the pigeon with Noah's Ark. It could be like the uh, canary in the mine. 
Um, they have lots of purposes of going out in spring, uh, letting the colony know this is what's out there and uh, what we can start doing. It could be uh, issues to do with uh, uh, predators coming, but uh, the uh, messenger bee has a lot of roles. Um, age, about 14 days, where to find them, away from the hive, during swarming, in flowering areas, near popular, uh, and uh, cone bearing trees inside buildings and cavities. Being it's not out on a mission to collect uh, resources, you can find these inside your house. You can find these in places where you'd wonder what to be doing there. It's a scout that's checking out the area and taking back information. Uh, it's a female, uh, defensive quality, minimal to no aggression. Uh, result, it's bringing regional news back to the colony. Uh, there's 300 or more scouts doing various things. Uh, replacement occurs continually. Uh, they, the unique characteristics. This scout is bringing back information and we're gonna have another one in a little bit that's a dance, waggle dancers. Uh, messages understood by nearby bees. Replacement occurs. I doubled that up and range about two miles. So that's Savannah, the messenger bee. Panning bees. Uh, in this one, the image you'll see in the background, uh, a lighthouse, but the lighthouse is a honeybee or it's a skep beehive. And they're fanning away from the hive and they're, alarm, uh, they're uh, fanning away uh, pheromone that's Marilyn, the fragrant. Uh, purpose, to distribute uh, colony scent. Appearance, head is in the direction of, uh, of the queen for scent distribution. Uh, wings are fanning, but uh, bee is stationary. Cause, sometimes uh, things change and uh, to confuse bees that are away from the colony, uh, the hive, and so the colony or uh, it's swarming and so they need to basically let other bees know what, where they are, where to find outside or inside the hive. Um, one of the ways to identify the frame that the queen is on is by looking at the top of the frames to see which bees, where their abdomens are pointing away. Uh, you can actually go pretty much to the frame that the bee is on. Uh, female, defensive quality, none. Um, helps bees find their colony. Uh, replacement occurs continually as needed, same as the colony for color. This is Ginger the communicator. Um, they have the news. They're sharing the local news to the inside of the colony and they dance it out. Uh, they uh, share heat and vibrations and they waggle. And so this is the waggle dancing bee. Uh, surrounded by other bees, they perform circles and, uh, and moving wings, found in the hive away from the brood or babies. Uh, they're active above 40 degrees because uh, bees don't fly uh, below 40 degrees. Uh, and while resources are available, uh, foraging age, two to six weeks, where to find inside the hive, not on a brood frame, but on a honey frame or a frame that's empty. Uh, it's a female, increased productivity uh, by sharing the message. Uh, they'll actually say where uh, forage is. Uh, sharing messages of resources. They look the same as the others. May have resources on leg, like pollen on the leg because they're sharing where that came from. And so that's our uh, Ginger, the communicator. Laying worker. Um, if you notice the optimum, the multiplier, uh, she has only boys in her hands. And so that's a laying worker. There's a bulletin board saying that there's a missing queen. The key here is that if a colony goes queenless for more than 20 days, you'll have a laying worker situation and you'll have lots and lots of boys show up uh, or be created. 
So now I'm not listing all the different items because you can create your own. It's going to be in the book. There's going to be lots. So that's the laying worker map quest B. Uh, we talked a little bit about that and how they can fly straight from where they're where they're full of resources straight home. Uh, that's this one, Amelia Hart, Amelia Earhart. I thought that was kind of cute. The navigator. Understanding roles helps. Once you know what is happening and why, then the beekeeper can alter the conditions to create a change. Or you can keep things the way they were. So rather than just waiting uh, for a problem to exist, you can actually be inducing your bees to do something uh, that you want to have happen first. In my case, I raise queens and I'm always changing situations in the hive to be what it is that I need. And if there's things that aren't going on, I can manipulate them to get them to happen. So there's some beekeepers, oh, I don't know what I should do. Sometimes uh, your colony is doing what it's supposed to do and you change it and you basically destroyed your colony. Uh, such as, oh, I found uh, a whole bunch of queen cells and I didn't want anything to happen. They were all capped and I wiped out all the queen cells. Well, once they're capped, the uh, queen that was in that colony is already gone. And so you just killed the colony. And within 20 days, you'll have a laying worker situation. So sometimes you can leave them the way they are. Beekeeping is more exciting than just creating honey. Um, so, Albert, I have a question. We've got a question for you. And a couple questions have just popped through here. Other than swarming, what would be a condition requiring the scent distribution? So going back up to the, the bee that was fanning. If you move your hive, um, the hive location changes. Um, maybe you're moving frames. Uh, bees get confused and they get out, out front and they share their pheromones. There's times where I've gone and I've taken a colony it has, it's a laying uh, worker situation where there's no queen, uh, there's a lot of bees uh, that are still worker bees, but you can see a lot of drones showing up. Well, I don't want those workers all to go to a new hive because there could be the laying workers in it. So I'll take another hive, put it in the old location, I'll move that hive somewhere else and all the foraging bees leave and go back to that new colony. Um, anytime you do a change, uh, even if it's inches and feet away, you'll have bees fanning uh, to let other bees know, hey, this is where, where we're at. So swarming could be one, it could be moving the hive, there could be something that happened that was bad. Um, I would imagine that happens all the time with commercial beekeeping when they're migrant, they're moving them from one location to the next. They have to do orientation flights, and in doing the orientation flight, learning that new location, they'll have fanning bees. Um, there could be a number of reasons why they they could be fanning, um, but the scent is from that queen, and so when they're fanning, they're sharing the scent of that local colony. Let's say there's another. Uh, be that it gets lost. Um, it can come to that colony and but as long as it brings resources, uh, if it brings resources, it'll be accepted into that new colony. Um, but if it's not, it's treated as a robber uh, because robbers don't carry carry goods with them. So <laughs> here's here's a fun question for you, Albert. If the royal excrement remover, if <laughs> nurse bees and house bees stay in the hive first to third weeks, are they excrement removers or do they actually go out on cleansing flights? <laughs> no, I bet you that it's uh, turned into uh, another bee that's a baggage handler. <laughs> 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 it gets kind of down the line. Um, because one of the things that we teach is that 
the bees that are in the brood chamber where the queen is, they start there and they slowly work their way out. So there has to be some uh, communication and passing of goods back and forth out of the brood chamber. Are there more? For right now, that's what I've got. <laughs> Thank you. Cause and effect uh, beekeeping. Uh, if I do this, then this will result. Now, there's lots of different things that uh, happen with a colony. Um, there's sometimes things that we do that uh, we don't think about, but it causes a result. Uh, it could be anything from uh, you have your gloves on and you go to inspect another colony with your hive tool and that colony is sick and you come back, that colony that you inspect afterwards will become sick because of it because you went in and you transferred uh, disease from one colony and introduced it to another. Um, that's a negative cause and effect. There's lots of positive things that you can do. Everything from uh, if I feed the bees early in spring, for example, um, and induce them to uh, produce wax, uh, they'll be brooding up earlier and you'll have a stronger colony. Feeding them in winter, there's times when uh, your colonies wouldn't have had enough resources for the year or for the summer months. Here in uh, Canada, you can go four to six months where the bees have to stay in the hive. Uh, so giving them resources can help them build up during the time that they're isolated. Um, there's lots of different things that we can do and they're absolutes. If you do this, this will result. Um, and that's what my book is gonna be uh, focused on. If you do this, this will result. Um, there's a lot of times that we do things like those queen cells, you destroy them. Oh, this is what the result's gonna be. Um, you move your colony during the day, during the daylight hours, you move it, uh, who knows how far away, a mile away. The bees coming back won't know where home is. Uh, that's a negative cause and effect. Uh, there may be uh, issues where you may want to have that happen. And one example is, let's say you have robbing going on. Bees in the area have somehow found a weakness and they're coming and they're bombarding uh, this little colony or a big colony uh, and they're beating it up and they're robbing from it. So you can cover it up with a wet sheet. You can lock the bees in in the shade or you can move them to another location. Um, here's one that I saw actually on uh, Facebook today. It showed a, a plug and underneath the plug showed honey dripping down the wall. And well, okay, one, that's telling you that there's bees in the wall, but what some will miss is that bees will never tolerate uh, honey to be leaking inside their colony because it induces robbing. So if there's honey leaking down the wall, that's telling you that the colony is dead and that it's being robbed out. And so that's just a sign. It, it allows you to see what's going on. Um, there's another little trick that I teach. Let's say you have bees in an area where they shouldn't be. They've gone into a fireplace chimney, they've gone into a flue or a stone wall or some place where you can't physically go in and remove them or you just don't want to do that. And uh, one of the little cause and effect is because you know from what I just told you that honeybees won't tolerate uh, honey leaking in their hive because they know that it's going to induce rotting. If you have a colony that is in a location where they shouldn't be on a nice summer's morning, go smear honey all over the outside of that entrance, all over the wall, just the whole bunch. And then what's gonna happen is the bees in the area are gonna find it. They're gonna know that there's something wrong because no colony would have ever left that. And they're gonna clean it up and they're gonna look to see where it came from. 
the poor bees that are hiding in that little hole are thinking, how did that get there? We didn't put it there. And then next thing you know that the bees are robbing, they're actually entering the colony and they're stealing resources. And what will end up happening is the colony will leave, they'll vacate, they'll take off because they're losing their population. The queen will leave because she's not getting her resources. The bees that are robbing will em uh, empty the entire uh, area of resources. Wax moth, which is in every hive, will then uh, grow, eat the wax, everything will fall down, the area will be empty. And so a simple way to get bees out of an area where they shouldn't be is on a nice uh, morning in summer, just smear honey on the outside of the opening until other bees find it, which will be soon because they look for uh, the scent and they'll end up uh, telling all their friends, the wasps will tell their friends. And before you know it, the whole area will be covered with uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, bees and wasps going for a free lunch. And so understanding the cause and effect, there's a lot of things, if you do this, this is what's gonna happen. Uh, if, what's, what's another one? Um, bees are drawn to light. Uh, if you have uh, uh, bees inside your house and they're flying around and you don't want them there, how do you get them out? Close all the windows, put drapes all down, leave one window open with the light and open it up. And the bees will look to that light and will fly right out of the building because that's what they're looking for. So cause and effect. So it's in everything we do with beekeeping. The sad thing is that we always look for it after the fact rather than looking for things preemptively and solving the problems before the problems happen. Questions? None? Not a one? How'd you guys like my bees? Your bees are beautiful. Those are so yeah, fun. We have, we have 40 to 50 of them. Uh, so this book uh, is going to be about 100, 100 plus pages. Uh, it's going to end up having lots and lots of images and not just of roles, but uh, profiles of bees. At the end, we're going to actually have other bee, uh, bee superheroes that are native bees from the area. Um, they all have jobs. They have unique abilities. Um, it's almost like seeing the Avengers or Marvel comic, uh, the bee world. There's thousands and thousands of bees. And a lot of bees have different jobs and they look differently. We might look at them and think, oh, they're going to sting. But solitary, solitary bees aren't looking to sting anybody. Um, bumblebees will. And so that's, I think, most of what uh, my book is going to be. Um, there's going to be lots and lots of stuff. And the whole focus is to teach from a child's perspective of what's going on in a hive in a way that they already understand. And the reason is you have kids that play games and they understand characters of games like no other. They'll memorize that they can do this and they can do that. Well, this whole uh, book is going to focus on how uh, their roles can affect uh, their abilities and what they're doing to be successful. And yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think that's it. Okay, so, Elmer, so, a couple questions. What we would like is we want we want questions. Yeah, I have a couple questions here. If the bees have to vacate quickly and the queen is still heavy, how can she fly? What, what goes on if they have to leave quickly, but the queen can't, can't really fly? They leave her you know, behind? A lot, of times, a lot of times before she swarms, uh, she'll be weaned off of food for a little bit uh, to get smaller. But there's times where I've seen swarms that uh, the queen is so big and heavy that she can't fly. 
uh, she lands right on the ground and that's where she sits until she can lighten up a little bit and gain a little bit of strength and then she can fly off. Um, yeah, but we want big queens. A big queen is uh, a sign of a strong, healthy queen. Um, yeah, good so, question. So is there an average number of bees in a colony? Yeah, about 60,000 in a full-size hive. Um, I've told that they can be bigger up to 120,000. Uh, small uh, colonies can be like ones that I have. Uh, I can start a colony with about a thousand bees. Um, a package of bees is between 7,000 and 10,000 bees. What about a nuck or a nuke? A nuke. Yeah, a nuke, my little kitty. Um, a nuke is a half of half of a colony. Um, it's I don't. It's probably about the size of a uh, a package. Uh, swarms can be considerably bigger. Um, I've captured thirteen pound swarms. So imagine catching bees. How small a tiny bee is, and having that weigh, and finding out that the weight is thirteen pounds. That's a lot of weight. For a tiny little honeybee. Yeah, that is. That's a lot um, of bees. So. So yeah. So Albert, there's in in everything that you've looked at and watched the bees and in all your observations here, how do you account for the great diversity and yet they still work as a unit? That's a that's a very their cool whole focus. Theory. Their whole focus is to work for the team. Um, there are individual jobs, there are community jobs, and there's in, uh, regional jobs that are done by the bees, but their whole focus is for the colony. So for example, a honeybee, if it's getting old and feeble, it typically isn't going to die at the colony in the hive. It's going to die away because they know that uh, somehow innately in their DNA that if they are near the hive, it's going to cause other issues. For example, let's say, let's say you have uh, bees that are dead around the front entrance of your colony. You're gonna have wasps and hornets that are gonna come and take those away. Once there's no more of them to be hauled away, then the wasps and hornets attack your colony. So it's important for you to keep your colonies clean, otherwise you'll have issues. And so, um, yeah. So I'm gonna kind of skip around on some of these questions just to keep some unity here. And it appears bees may have multiple jobs throughout their lives. What turns on the switch from one job to the, uh, to the next? Mostly age, but understand that they could be doing multiple types of jobs at one time. Um, when you look at all these different types of jobs, um, a bee can go between some of these jobs and be performing a couple or more of them at one time. But you can see them, you can identify the individual one being done. Well, you can't see the chemist. Uh, that's a hard one to see. Dock workers you can see. Um, but there's, there's a bunch of these, that, they could be all being done, uh, or a bunch of them could be done at the same time by a bee. Um, there, most of the jobs that are performed start and they progress with age. Um, uh, as there's a need, my internet connection is unstable. Um, as there's a need, the bees fill it. That's just the way it is. Uh, in our society, we usually have people, uh, you ask for somebody to do something, in a bees world, it's not that way. They they fill jobs as it's needed. And again, it's mostly by age. As the bee gets bigger and older, uh, it moves on to other jobs. Um, one of the ones is like, okay, here, let's go on to uh, one that is where they're producing wax. Well, bees that are creating wax um, they eventually stop, but 
they can be induced to make wax again. Because if you take a group of bees from a colony and put it in with uh, a frame of uh, open brood that has eggs, all of a sudden you have bees that are producing wax again. And so you can induce bees back to prior, prior jobs. But most of these jobs, they progress at, with age. And a bee lives four to six weeks. So some of these are early. Uh, the ones that are around the queen, the attendants, are younger. Uh, as they go out of the hive and forage and defend, those are older bees. So Albert, do the bees change their behavior or their jobs if they've got varroa mites? Or any other, you know, any of the viruses? I know the viruses can really change, make them change. What's your opinion? You know, there's some, for example, a groomer bee. Um, grooming bees will uh, care for each other and we want that to happen. It's hygienic behavior. And so um, one of the traits that we hope is that uh, if you have mites or if you have issues with mites, that your bees will be hygienic where they'll clean each other's mites off of each other. And so that is a behavior that isn't in all colonies, uh, but you want it to be. Uh, and that's as a result to the uh, grow mite. So that is a job, the uh, uh, grooming bees, that's hygienic behavior as a result, mostly because of issues going on, such as mites. Okay, so we're gonna get a little off of behavior here, just a little bit. Um, what do you feed your bees and, and when? <laughs> no, that's a packed question. I know, that's a whole class <laughs> unto itself, isn't it? Um, the issue with feeding is, okay, if you go to your colony and your colony is struggling, let's say it's Utah, it's middle of summer. Uh, there's not a lot of food out because of it being hot. Um, your bees are struggling to bring in resources. Well, what do you do? Um, the rule of thumb in Utah is that you don't feed your bees sugar water and other things if it could be stored as a honey reserve. But the other rule of thumb is the bottom two boxes in uh, uh, North America are considered to be resources for the bees. So if those two boxes aren't full yet, can you feed them to help them along? Yes. Uh, some people feel that feeding bees is a negative thing. Well, another negative thing is that we have put bees is where there's way more bees than what that area would have ever had naturally. And so we're putting them into places that they're having to compete and fight with each other or the resources aren't high enough. Another example, in spring, when we get bees, uh, there's lots of forage, there's lots of blossoms, everything's great. The bees go out, they find it, they bring it back, they build up a big colony in places like Utah or Nevada or other places like that where the summer goes through a period of dearth where there's not a lot of resources, then these colonies that are now gigantic don't have the resources in the environment to sustain them. And so then those colonies struggle. So um, if your bees don't have sufficient uh, in those bottom boxes and you're into a dearth, you feed them. What do you feed them? There's lots of different things on the market. Um, sugar water is a, a good one. Uh, I always use cane sugar, but there's people that'll say it doesn't matter. Um, I add nutrients to it so that they're getting more than just the sugar water. Uh, during the summer when there's no resources, you'll see bees collecting soda pop. I was in uh, Washington DC two years ago and uh, about uh, two blocks away from the White House, in between the hot White House and the uh, uh, Lincoln Memorial, there was garbage can right on the uh, basket, right on the curbs. And I was drawn to it because I could see bees. And I went and I took pictures of the bees because all these bees were going into these cups that still had traces of 
uh, soda pop. And I thought, I, I thought it was amazing how here the bees are in an area that uh, I didn't see flowers. I didn't see a lot of forage for them, but they had stuff in the trash can that they were uh, uh, using. And so which would you rather them to find stuff like that or you add it uh, for them so that you can control uh, what's gonna be eaten later on. Um, so I believe in helping bees along. If there's an issue, don't just let them uh, fend for themselves. Just like if the mites uh, are out of control, your colony is gonna die. Um, if you check the mite counts and the mite counts are high, if you do nothing, cause and effect, they will die. And so as a, uh, a lover of bees, what's your option? You can do nothing and buy another package next year, or you can care for those bees and find a way, whether it be caging the queen and having them go through a brood break, and that's cause and effect. Um, Cause then what happens is the mites uh, don't have any place to incubate and your mite count goes down. So it's a plus plus. Um, Eating during the winter time, there's times where we get our colonies all the way to winter's door, but there's not enough resources in the hive. Well, your problem was that you didn't give enough earlier, so cause and effect, you didn't care for them earlier, your bees are gonna die earlier into the winter. Now, on the other hand, if you would have seen that that was happening, you could have been feeding them earlier, um, whatever it is that you wanna feed them, you could be feeding them honey, you can, whatever it is you wanna feed them, but then they could be stored up better for winter. And so if you're not looking for the uh, various issues in the hive, you could be uh, br uh, blindsided with a problem that you could have easily taken care of earlier in the year. Uh, feeding is one of them. Uh, mites, I know that there's a, a big, uh, divide on whether you treat or not treat. Um, if there's a problem, treat. Are there natural ways uh, to take care of the mites? There are. Uh, you can uh, create a new queen. That queen goes through a period where she has to incubate and the colony goes broodless. So then there's no places for the mites to incubate. Um, just understand, even if you do take care of the mites in your hive, cause and effect, your neighbors have bees, your people down the block have bees, nobody's treating for mites, your bees are healthy, they're gonna go get mites because they're gonna rob those colonies because they're weak. They're gonna bring all the resources, all the problems back to your, uh, your area. And so it might seem like you don't have an issue with mites toward fall, then all of a sudden you're overrun it's because others didn't take care of their bees and your bees were successful enough to take all the resources and mites back to your hive. So you need to check. Um, yeah, there's lots of cause and effects. And that's what most of the books that we have out there deal with. But they say, this is the problem and this is how you treat it. Um, I like to look at it from, uh, this could be a problem, how do you prevent it? Uh, rather than waiting for the problem to happen. And what has helped me the most with understanding and seeing all this stuff is smaller colonies where you can actually get into them and look and watch and see how they're acting and behaving, uh, what they're doing. The full-size hives, it's harder to see things happening because you don't want to go in all the time and look. You don't want to see, uh, open up your hive all the way to the brood all the time, because every time you do, you stand a chance of hurting your queen. And so once you start getting into the honey boxes, you don't touch the queen box. You just leave those alone because they should be still just as good as they were before. Um, with the smaller colonies, it's easier to be a little bit more intrusive than the bigger hives. And the bigger hives, again, let's say that you, uh, inadvertently pull out a frame and it's a frame that had the queen on it. And as you pulled it out, because you pulled out the wrong frame, you rolled her in between the frame and you broke her legs. Well, now you have an issue that 
uh, that uh, colony is going to go queenless. Well, she has brood, so you're going to create a new queen. That's a good thing because then you're not going to have the royal mite because it's going to go broodless for a while. Then you're going to have a new vibrant queen, so that's a plus. So there's lots of fun little cause and effects going on all the time. So Albert, a couple questions, a couple more questions here. Um, how do you tell whether there's a nectar flow or a dearth of, of nectar? I mean, that for me as a horticulturist, that's an easy one, but go for it. I should let you answer it. <laughs> it's your show. Um, I look to see if there's wax being built. If there's wax being uh, built, um, you know that there's nectar flow going on because that's how they, that's how and why they create wax. Um, if you see flowers, walk up and down your block. If you see flowers, the likelihood is you're going to have nectar going on. The more flowers, the more nectar flow you have. Um, in Matt, uh, there's a real boom bust where it's in the middle of summer when the canola is all in bloom. And you'll see it for miles everywhere, uh, alfalfa all over. Um, when that's up, the bees are going to grow really, really fast. But if you're looking up and down the street and you don't see anything, or you're going through where it's just been rainy, 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 well, then the bees aren't going out to get food. And so they're using resources up in the hive. That can be just as much of a dearth. So you think, well, how is a rainy season a dearth? Well, because the bees can't go out and fly. They can't fly in the rain because of their abdomen. They'll, they'll die, they'll drown. Uh, bumblebees can but honeybees can't. So that's a special trait for a, hun a bumblebee that they can fly uh, in the rain, they can fly a little bit more in the cold and they can fly and can find areas like greenhouses. Honeybees can't. Um, it's just not a part of their uh, special superpowers. So when I, so Albert, when I teach the Master Gardener program and when I um, teach on bees and pollinators, I always encourage people to have a, a flower garden with a diversity of plants that bloom from April to October with an emphasis on that summer to late fall so that there is, there is nectar or, or pollen source for the bees because summer, summer can be just as bad as the middle of winter as far as, as nectar resources. So having Having something blooming all the time is really important. So Albert, the next question here is, can you elaborate what ways a beekeeper can encourage wax production or, or for farming wax? So someone wants wax. Uh, the way I do it is I feed my bees. Uh, if you want wax, see, one of the things, and don't get this all wrong, but understand it, um, I want honeycomb. Uh, that's one of the things that I shoot for. And, but one of the things that's hard is to get the wax made that they can put the honey into. So I'll have a hive that I'm actually feeding where they have all the resources uh, that they need to build lots of wax. Once the wax is built up, I then move it to another colony that is in an area where they can actually fill it with resources. So one of the easiest ways to produce wax is by feeding your, your bees. Um, sugar water is a phenomenal inducer for them producing wax. Uh, and so that's, that's how I would do it. If, if they're in an area that is full of blooms, they're gonna to produce tons of wax because they have the resources and they know that they're gonna need the room to expand. Um, so, so Albert, um, people that do top bar beehives, top bar beekeeping, 
isn't that also another way to to get bees to build wax because you just you've got this odd shape and so the bees have to build their own comb if you have a void and there's a nectar flow they'll fill that void and so yeah but the issue is that uh, not that there's uh, space, but how do they produce it? Um, if bees don't have resources, it doesn't matter if there's a cavity, they won't fill it. They need the, the resources. Um, last year, I had a big colony that was doing really good. They were building fast, but I wanted to take and put comb of babies into small little frames from the big hive. And so what I did is I put in frames that didn't have foundation tightly in between other frames. And then these frames that were in the middle got filled with natural wax. I then pulled those out and cut them and put them into the smaller frame and replaced that empty frame back into the hive. And I was able to get many cycles of brand new white wax with um, uh, eggs and larvae in it that I was able to start new colonies with. So having a void is good if you have the resources for them to produce the wax. Wax is produced from an excess of nectar. If you don't have that nectar going on, it doesn't matter. You can induce the nectar by feeding them. Okay. Um, okay, so this one's a little tricky, Albert. I'm not sure I, I don't know the answer on this one, so we're going to try to stump the beekeeper here. Can you talk about the importance of mushrooms? I hear that psilocybin is really important to their health. Yeah, I, I don't do much with mushrooms. Um, I know that uh, trees that are old and rotting have cavities and that those are the locations that bees go to in nature and that they do well in it. So there are issues that I know of that mushrooms and bees would be in harmony with each other, um, but I haven't done any testing with mushrooms and bees. I've uh, seen stuff and heard stuff, but for me, I, ha I don't know. Yeah, the, the University of Washington is doing quite a bit of research with the mushrooms and and extracts from different different species of mushrooms, different cultivars. So I, I I read about it, but I'm not sure I I'm not I'm not convinced, <laughs> I guess. So so here's one that's kind of a um, a political box. What are your thoughts on neonicotinoid poisoning in the hive? And I can, I can kind of give some clues on that one too, but go for it. Yeah, we know that it happens. Um, uh, one of the questions that I ask people is, um, what's the risk of pesticides um, being an issue in a city? Okay. Uh, the next question that I ask is, um, how many people that use pesticides from say Home Depot or uh, maybe not even any kind of department store, um, do they read the label before they use it? Most people don't. Um, the issue with uh, flowering fruit trees, you're supposed to um, treat them uh, when they're at the end of their flower so that they don't have the, the bugs that are in them yet. You're not supposed to do it during the day because that's when the bees are all foraging. Um, even if you were to treat it and you did it at night, the issue is you should be moving the bees from that location. Uh, so are there issues with Neil? Oh, I think they're all over the place. And it's in pollen, it's in nectar, it's in everything. And the key is to make sure that you're doing everything you can to keep your bees away from that. Um, so Albert, I'm going to wait. To be honest, I don't know how you can stop, uh, especially if you're in the city limits. I don't know how you can avoid it because I think there's going to be a lot of uh, stuff being used. And here's one example. 
and it's a horrible one. Um, I had about 15 to 20 colonies on one street in Draper, Utah. And I think I had about three colonies per house that were up and down the street. It was really nice location. It was within uh, a half a mile of the mountains. And uh, I got to the middle of summer and these colonies were growing great. Well, one of the homes that uh, they were at, uh, I had three colonies. Uh, the backyard was about a half acre of just zucchini. And zucchini produces not nectar, but pollen, it produces lots of pollen. And anyway, uh, we went uh, from midsummer to later summer. And when I went back after adding boxes to all these colonies, because they all were just going great, I went back and every single colony in that neighborhood was dead. Dead. There's bees dead everywhere. Inside the hive, out the front of the hive, there were dead bees everywhere. And I was just really uh, bummed because that's a lot of, a lot of colonies. Um, it wasn't until a year or two later that uh, I was moving from the neighborhood that a lady that I had bees at her house wanted all my raspberry uh, canes. And so she was digging up all these canes. And one day when I came home, uh, I went to talk to her in my yard and she said, you know, I want to come clean. And I said, what do you mean come clean? She said, well, um, you remember the bees that you had in my backyard? And I said, yeah. And she said, you remember all the zucchini plants? I said, yeah. And she said, well, one day, this was our first year uh, planting anything. We had never planted anything before. And she said, we had these little bugs uh, on our zucchini flowers. And so they went into a store and asked what we should do. We have bugs on our flowers. Well, that's a fairly generic question. And they were told to sprinkle seven on all of the flowers. Well, that's like putting poison into a candy dish and putting it on your counter for all the kids in the house to come and eat. And so what happened is the bees were going to the zucchinis for protein, for brooding up and for growing and feeding the queen. And then all of a sudden, all of those flowers were laced with poison and it killed every single colony. Now, I got to know what happened because of knowing the lady, but how many times do we have that happen in our yards and our apiaries? And we don't know why it happened. Um, we just know that they all died. Well, the sad thing is being in the neighborhood in a city where people are beginners at gardening, beginners at taking care of a home, they can do things that they shouldn't do. And it can have a side effect that it'll kill your colony. And in most cases, you don't know why. So here's my two cents worth on all this also, Albert, is that, and you're right, in the city, in towns, homeowners are more apt to grab an insecticide and spray and not know the insect that they're trying to kill. And then a lot of people have yard care companies like True Green or Chemlon, and those companies spray a soup onto your lawn and it has an insecticide in it, which is usually a neonicotinoid and a fungicide. And it turns out that fungicides act as a synergist to insecticides. And so that fungicide will make that insecticide 10 times more potent than what it was by itself. And the neonicotinoids out there now are actually have a low toxicity, especially to, to humans and dogs, cats. But when you blend it with a fungicide, you make it a lot more toxic. Well, people don't know that when they hire a yard care company. And most of those kids that are spraying the lawns, they don't know that either. So they're just running through and spraying everything. And so the, in town, you can have a little bit of problems. You have a lot more flower resources in town, but you also have a lot more pesticide issues. And everyone likes to point their finger at agriculture, but the agricultural people are held to a much higher standard than homeowners. And they take that, read the label very seriously People who apply chemicals for agricultural applications don't want to lose their license. And so they don't, 
they really try to avoid drift. Drift does happen, but they try to avoid putting anything where it doesn't belong, and they typically only do it early in the morning. So you have to turn and look at homeowners, which use, which according to the EPA statistics, they have purchased as much insecticides and herbicides as the agricultural sector. So it's so that, that's kind of a political hot box there, but um, you just have to talk to your, if you're in town, talk to your neighbors, get to know your neighbors and let them know what you're doing and go to your extension office and ask them for help on alternative methods to, to using some of this stuff. So you can, you gotta, you can avoid it, but you've gotta, you gotta talk to, you gotta talk to your neighbors, find out what they're doing. And then here's, a, here's another one for you, Albert. Any tips on attracting swarms to your yard? So it's like, hey, bees, come here. <laughs> um, any, any suggestions on that one? Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love swarms. Um, in Utah, I think uh, the... I'm going to give you a background first. In Utah, the, I caught, I think, 75 swarms one season. Um, I collected swarms for about 10 years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and I've done cutouts uh, for about 10, 12 years. One of the things that I've seen on every single cutout that I did, without question, even here in Saskatchewan, that within a yard or two of where they chose to be, um, there was a water source. Uh, bees can fly a long way for food, but they can't go very far if their colony is overheating. Um, babies in the hive, both eggs and larvae, if it gets too hot and dry, they'll die. And so they need to be near a water source. So one of the things uh, for helping a swarm uh, come near you is have a water source. That's vital. Uh, food, they can go a long way, but uh, water, they can't. Um, lemongrass uh, is an, uh, helps induce um, the cavity that the bees want to be in. There's people that say, oh, it has to be north facing, south facing, or whatever it is. Um, I've seen every location you can think of uh, for honeybees to be in, uh, high, low ground, uh, rocks, um, in bushes, I've seen them everywhere. Um, but if you're going to try and induce them, um, have about the size of a, uh, a single uh, standard Langstroth box. Um, you would like to have the smell of propolis in the inside. So if it was a box that was used before and it has propolis and glue and stuff on the inside, the bees can smell that. If you don't have much, you can always go get some beeswax and melt it on the inside of the box. Don't, have, don't ever, ever add food to a, an area that you're hoping to get a swarm in. Uh, food induces a robbing frenzy and a a colony will never go to a place that there's a robbing frenzy because they have to defend right off the bat. So don't put in food, but put in all the smells that you can possibly put. You can put propolis, you can melt it, you can burn it on the inside, you can put wax, melt it, burn it on the side, you can use lemongrass. There are different uh, places now that have uh, queen pheromones. If you ever have a queen that dies and you have her, take her and put her in alcohol. Um, and then that alcohol is a queen pheromone. It smells like a queen. And you can use that inside any uh, bait hive box that you have. Um, matter of fact, I used to have a little jar and all the queens that I would get would go in there. Um, virgin queens don't really count. It has to be a mated queen. And uh, keep them, don't throw them away. Uh, you can use that for uh, swarm lure all the time. Um, so yeah, you can put in frames that have uh, pollen, just not uh, honey or nectar. Um, yeah. 
Okay. So can you talk a little bit about water and what's needed as far as, you know, like put out a dish with rocks in it or talk to us you about, know, about how do you water your, give your bees water? I used to think that uh, you needed to keep uh, water 15 feet or further away from your hive because it was hard for bees to locate it. Um, but when I was in Jordan, the country of Jordan, I saw bees going uh, to water sources wherever they could get it. And it didn't matter how close it was to their hive. So um, have it there. Now, Dr. Hoon, which you've had him at conferences in the past, uh, there's an article that he has in uh, the Bee Culture magazine where uh, he did tests and back in China, he discovered that bees would even visit urinals uh, for water uh, because of the salts that are in them. We might think that bees just need fresh water, but they also need salt water. Uh, I've seen bees in Utah going to little sludge ponds that are just yuck. Uh, we think that they need fresh water and uh, not pond or sewer, but what would they have had in nature in the past? Um, I've seen uh, animal salt licks that have formed a little puddle where the animal licks. And I've seen bees all the way around that little uh, uh, indentation licking up water, which must have been high concentration of salt. Um, I don't think it matters so much uh, anymore what type of water it is. Um, and I don't think I would care so much of where it's located. However, I don't like things to be too close to my colonies because I don't want to induce something that's going to cause another problem. So I put a water source close to my hives. It's bringing in other bees to collect water and inadvertently some scout sees another thing and all of a sudden I have a robbing frenzy. Um, I like to keep things that can jeopardize my colonies away from my colonies. Um, the sad thing with water is in spring, the bees will go to a water source and once they find it, they're loyal to it. So if you don't start soon enough, soon enough trying to figure out where the water source is gonna be, and they end up going to the pool next door and they get all upset or the water fountain next door and they get upset, you can't stop them from doing that. You gotta move them away for a period and then bring them back. Um, you can't, it's not like you can go talk B <laughs> and uh, tell the bees, no, you better not go there anymore. They're gonna try and kill you. Um, you have to be prepared for that. And uh, having a water source that you plan on and the water source could be a leaky faucet. It could be uh, an animal uh, uh, trough. Lots of different ways. But uh, the other issue is that if it's something like a pool or a pond or uh, an animal trough, the sad thing is that bees like to try and hover uh, over the water to collect it. And when they do it, their legs get touched, uh, caught in the water. And next thing you know, you have hundreds of dead bees uh, floating around in the water. Um, take little wooden or plastic things and throw them in the water so that the bees can land on them, go to the edge, collect it, and come back. Um, if it's an animal trough, the animals can move it with their nose or whatever. Hopefully they don't get stung if it's an active trough. But they need little things to land on. Otherwise, the bees, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of bees that died collecting the water. And that takes away from your population. It takes four to six weeks for those to regenerate themselves, whereas they could have been productive if you had something for them to land on. It can be wood, it can be plastic, uh, almost anything. Um, I've seen uh, a leaky garden hose covered with bees. I've Again, I've seen little indentations even in salt licks. So water can be obtained from anywhere. Um, yeah, would you, it, what do they do with the water? What's their purpose? They don't necessarily drink it. Um, they use it to control the environment inside the hive. That's the HVAC that we talked about earlier. 
uh, they have to control the humidity and the temperature. If it gets too hot and if the humidity goes down, um, your colony will die. And that humidity doesn't have to go down much. Um, and you just lost your colony. And if you lose your colony, if you lose a brood cycle because it got too hot in your hive and it goes through another brood cycle and you lose it, your colony is now dead. They can't recoup. You just lost two full brood cycles. You're done. It's over. Um, so water is extremely vital. Um, someone asked, how do you prevent mosquitoes and not harm bees with water sources? There's a, um, the mosquito dunks, little gray donut looking things, hard, hard as rocks. And it's Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. Throw it in there, it's not gonna hurt your bees, but it, it'll take out the mosquito larva and um, gnats and midges and all sorts of things. So, so BTI is what would work for that one. And in so, Utah, you can be put on the mosquito abatement uh, exclusion list. And when they go around spraying different ponds and areas for uh, uh, mosquitoes, uh, they stop spraying 300 feet before they get to where your apiary is, and they continue about 300 feet after. Uh, the other thing is try and find out what the mosquito abatement is using. Um, because there's some things that they spray at night at dusk and by morning it's inert, it wouldn't affect your bees. So knowing what they're using is just make, make a call to your city and just ask and ask uh, how close to this area do you spray and what do you spray with? And if it's something that's bad, you can make a request. So another, another good question for you, Albert. So, um, what is the highest you have seen bees off the ground in a home of choice, working on a platform idea to keep bears away? Also, how far will they go to find a food source? Um, the highest I think I've seen that I've uh, been a part of is about 40 feet. It was a tree that fell, dropped. Um, and uh, the people called me because this this tree had shattered and there were bees all over the place. And we took a big chunk that still had comb and stuff in it. And dang, the queen was still there. She was still alive. Everything was good. We were able to pull them out. Um, I've seen them on rock ledges pretty high uh, in Southern Utah. Um, but typically Tom Seeley says 15 to 20 feet is the height that they would choose. But it also has to depend on where their locations are that they can find. If they're looking for a home and uh, there's issues that it's getting to the end of the day, they don't wanna be stuck somewhere out overnight or uh, during a rainstorm or a snowstorm or who knows what's going on in spring. And so they're opportunists. They're gonna find whatever space they can. But if it's a big heavy queen, she might have a hard time going up really high. Uh, the bigger the queen, the lower that she would most likely be. Okay. Um, and the other one you just asked was about bears. Um, yeah. You know, I haven't had to deal with bears, but uh, you don't want them to learn that your hives are a place that they can go to. Uh, from what I understand, once a, a bear uh, gets a sweet Hello, tooth. Hello, babe. What's that? I heard somebody. Once a, a bear gets a sweet tooth, uh, they'll go through almost anything to get to it again. Um, so having them higher off the ground, having them with a electric fence, um, anything you can. And by all means, don't uh, uh, litter your area from things that you've taken out of the hive. You scrape frames and throw them on the ground or uh, a colony is dead so you take all the bees that are in it that were left and you just throw them on the ground because you're just enticing something else to come and have at it and once they find that are they right where your other hives are? Um, yeah, bears are a tough one. 
but I haven't had to deal with them yet. Raccoon and skunk I have, uh, but bears. Yeah, so in, in Wyoming, up in the Bighorn Basin, where all the barley fields are, they have the beekeepers up there have a lot of trouble with bears. And so they do use electric fence and um, the solar electric fence. I think they use car batteries to charge them. So they're looking for something a little stronger. So boy, yeah, here I, see, here yeah. I see the electric fences being used. Yep, yep. Um, so if you close up your hive prior to mosquito spray, then don't open till a day after the spray, will that protect the bees from the pesticide? So, um, for, so Melissa, you need to get a hold of your city or county or whoever's spraying for mosquitoes. Find out what they're using because a lot of times they're gonna they they use pretty benign products like the Bacillus thuringiensis. But do get a hold of them, find out, and let them know that you've got bees. And the best thing to do is is close up the hive, not let the bees go out early in the morning, or close them up early in the afternoon whenever they're spraying. But it's, it should just have a short residual and not last much through the night. So I'm not seeing any other questions. Again, you know, you're welcome to raise your hand and ask a question direct or type it into chat. I've um, at the Bee College, I have Albert do a program called What I Didn't Know, I Didn't Know. And I think you've made it as far as like the fourth slide or something in that program. So Albert's an absolute wealth of beekeeping knowledge and information. I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, so when will your book be available? <laughs> I'm guessing by summer. Very good, that's fast. Well, That's I've point. been working on it all year, and so it, uh, I think it's come a long, a long, long way. I, um, you know, you work things out and you think, oh, it's going to go this direction, but then things happen and it starts going a different direction. And um, this one has had a lot of different changes, but uh, the artwork is phenomenal. Uh, and the focus, again, is uh, teaching kids about honeybees, um, what to look for, why it's happening. Um, the neat thing is at the end of the book uh, is a section for uh, magical properties of uh, honey and experiments, things that you can do. And uh, you can, it'll be listed what will happen and you can try it. So for example, uh, one of the little magical properties of honey um, is that honey likes, well, it was dehydrated by the bee. The bee took away the moisture and it wants to rehydrate itself. That's just the way it is. And uh, if you were to take uh, different types of uh, low moisture fruit, uh, vegetables, uh, you can add it to honey. And within a couple of weeks, you have honey that's flavored by the moisture that came from that uh, produce. Um, we've done it with lots of different things from orange skins, uh, lemon peels, uh, papaya, mango, um, raspberries, strawberries, but you gotta uh, uh, be a little bit careful with those because they have high moisture content. Uh, we've done it with jalapenos, taking a fresh jalapeno, putting it into honey, and over the course of two weeks, it dehydrates. It dries out inside the honey. And in two weeks, you have this honey that tastes like jalapeno. And initially, it doesn't have the heat. But as it matures, it gains the heat. Um, fun story, uh, I had a whole bunch of jars that I made for a conference. And I brought some of them back. And a couple came into the store. Uh, he was like six foot six and his wife, uh, tiny, and they saw this jar and I asked him if they liked jalapeno. And they both said, oh yeah, we love jalapeno. And I said, can you eat it like just raw? And they said, oh yeah, we eat the whole thing. I can't, I, I, I'm Canada Canadian. We don't eat a lot of hot stuff. 
And so I asked, there's this jar of honey that I have with this jalapeno that has been sitting for now a month. Uh, would you be interested in trying it to tell me what you think? I want you to try the jalapeno. And so they first tried the honey and they said, oh yeah, it tastes really good. Um, the lady bit probably equivalent to about the little bit of my pinky off of the jalapeno. And uh, within 10 seconds, she was at the garbage can spitting it out and said, oh, that's hot. Well, her husband, this big guy, huge guy, he took that jalapeno, and put it right into his mouth, started chewing the whole thing up. And I saw instant uh, tears show up in his eyes. And he finished it, but he said, that had to be the hottest jalapeno I had ever had in my life. Um, so all the moisture and liquid was sucked out of it and all that was left was the jalapeno. It had a little bit of sweet, but it was very hot. Um, but using that for things like uh, pork or uh, it would be really unique, adding it to uh, potatoes. Um, I've done garlic in honey. Uh, so that the honey is turned into a garlic flavor and you can use that with meats and potatoes. Um, you can add onions, you can add all sorts of stuff uh, to honey and you get different flavors. But the fun one is adding orange peel because after two weeks, all of the flavor in an orange peel uh, is what's in the orange. And so in two weeks, you have this honey that tastes like orange honey. And you didn't add oil to it. You didn't add something foreign. You just added orange peel. And all of a sudden you have this honey that tastes amazing. And you can have a whole bunch of different types of honey in your, uh, your kitchen by just putting different things in each jar, tiny little jar, and you have different things in each one of them and you have a big assortment of flavors. And not just putting one type of thing, adding a few different types of things into it the honey will pull out all the flavor and all the liquid. And then all of a sudden you'll have this flavor that is a mix. I knew of a guy years ago in Utah that created a garden variety flavor where he would take uh, various things from the garden and would put it in and it would become this garden variety honey flavor. Well, how unique is that? Um, so there's magical neat things you can do with honey. And there's lots of games that you can do, even with a colony. Uh, for example, taking a little water droplet and adding it to the front of the hive and watching the bees come and stick their proboscis into the droplet and suck it all up till it, so it's gone. A little kid can do that and it's actually kind of fun. Um, if you add honey to your hive is a bad thing because you can induce robbing. So if you're on a deck or somewhere, uh, put out little things and watch the bees eat it and take it and haul it away. Um, there's lots of little fun games that you can do with a bee colony that isn't a threat to uh, the people doing it uh, and is actually quite ins insightful. And so that's also going to be added to the book. There's going to be crosswords. There's going to be a lot of different little things that kids can play with. Um, but I think even adults, uh, I the images, uh, the gentleman that's uh, drawing these used to work for Mad Magazine. And he was one of their artists and he does a phenomenal job. I, uh, every time I, I kind of tell him, well, I need it to be like this. I need to have this and that. And he creates these uh, amazing drawings and he'll continue, but the book will be really fun. Well, we're all looking forward to it, Albert. That's uh, what, a, what a treat that will be, especially for the teachers that are in this program tonight and something to take to the class in the fall. And I had someone come in with a question about what are the challenges of keeping bees at higher elevations other than the shorter season? So you don't have the flower resources up there and what flowers you do have those are native flowers. And so now your European honeybees are competing with the native bees. And so the, the big issue that I have with this is there's not enough resources for everybody. And so usually the native bees lose out on it. So at, at that elevation, you don't have the flowers. You can try planting, but it is really a challenge to grow at that elevation. 
So you're going to need to be feeding your bees to so that they're not so competing with the natives. That's a that's a tough area to be trying to do be a beekeeper, definitely. Um, so I'm really not seeing a whole lot more questions coming in, Albert. It's now eight sixteen on my computer, so um, this has been a great program. Any, I'm not seeing any other questions, Albert. Any parting shots for us? Any words of wisdom? Um, no, but if you have other ideas of other roles or things that uh, uh, you've heard that you would like to see uh, included, send me a message, send me an email, Facebook. Uh, you can send me an email at albert at or albert dot chewback at gmail.com. Albert Chewback. It's the bottom of the screen. You can see Albert Chuback. So albert.chuback at gmail.com. Um, uh, for example, uh, it was somebody that uh, sent me a message of the uh, royal ex excrement uh, handler. And I was like, yeah, that's a good one. I like it. Um, so, yeah. And when it's finally done, it'll be on my website, ecobeebox.com. I'll probably post it also on uh, Facebook. So if you're looking there, it will be there too. Um, but I'm hoping uh, by midsummer it's finished. Uh, it's coming along pretty good though. Two more questions. <laughs> you gotta love this. Um, so first off, you cut your finger what a year ago? I mean, you, you cut your finger pretty bad. How is that? It's coming back. Looks good. Okay. We like to yeah, see it, that. that you know, so there's the good one. There's the bad one. This one I can move this far. That one I can't. Um, the, the most difficult thing isn't that it doesn't have full movement. It has enough. The most difficult thing is here in Saskatchewan when it gets cold, because I filleted it, uh, it cut straight down right through the middle. Um, it cut the uh, nerves and the vessels and stuff. And so here in winter time, it, it freezes really easy because it doesn't have the circulation. And so it, it hurts really bad when it, if I went outside here right now and it, it was cold, I went to shovel. I'd have to have something additionally on this thumb because it will get cold really easy and it hurts. So other than that, it took a long time to, uh, uh, I've been around power tools for 35, 40 years. And uh, after that happened, um, I really became skittish around the tools. Uh, it was a stupid thing I did. I shouldn't have done it. I, I knew afterwards I shouldn't have done it. If somebody else that uh, was with me was doing it, I would have told them off. But I just didn't think that day and I did something I shouldn't have done. And once it happened, dang, to be around another uh, saw where that thing's turning and it doesn't have any bad feelings if it hurts you, it's taken me a little bit to feel comfortable around um that was a bad enough injury that uh i second guess everything i do now um it was a bad injury uh yeah. they thought that that thumb was gonna have to be cut off and uh after i did it um i i looked at it and i could see half of my finger just hanging it was all the flesh and my first thought was I have to drive myself to the hospital like this. Well, how do you drive yourself to the hospital while you're holding your thumb? I couldn't even open the, the van door. And before I got to the hospital, I was already in shock. Uh, I passed out when I was there and uh, it, was, it was pretty bad. Um, yeah. So, but uh, if you don't get back on the bike, uh, maybe you never will. So I did, and well, I've been making stuff again. 
we would we would miss your bee boxes if you stopped. That would be tragic. That would be a double tragedy there if you stopped making your beehives. I've tried to think of other ways to do it, but there's none. There's none. Uh, I need to be the one being a part of it. And for me, I just have to build up the guts to be around those, those things. and learning to be safe. Before I used to be do things that were really high risk. Um, no, now it's okay. If I do this, how can I do it in such a way that there's no risk? And so I've developed lots of other different uh, jigs to make it so that my hands aren't uh, close at all to a moving blade. And uh, others will say, well, why don't you get the saw stop? Uh, it's a table saw that uh, it stops the instant that you touch the blade and you don't get cut, but it's a three, $4,000 item. Uh, and you get small companies, that's a lot of money to fork out, but this was a lot of money to fix. Yeah, I was gonna say, that wasn't, so it's still cost. Which costly. one do you do? Do you chop it off or do you invest? Well, sadly the money, rather than investing it, I'd rather put it back into my product and have something so that the company can grow. So. It's how, what game do you play all the way through trying to figure out which ends do you meet and which ones do you not? Um, it's tough. But let me just tell you that that was awful. Yeah. It was awful. We're, we're glad you survived. <laughs> we're really glad. <laughs> yeah. So, Albert, it's uh, almost 8.30. I've had you talking for two hours now. That's I, that's awesome. All your information and your knowledge on bees and beekeeping. I'll definitely have you back probably after the bee college when beekeeping really starts to get into the swing of things and get some of your wisdom on hive inspections and installing bees and what to look for in those first few first few weeks. So with that, I am going to call an end to our program tonight and i want to thank everybody who has hung in here to the end i appreciate that albert uh it's always a pleasure it's just always a pleasure talking with you and um i i met albert back in 2014 at an american beekeeping federation conference and i'm so happy i bumped into you out there in anaheim that was uh that was very serendipitous. So this has been recorded. I send it to my secretary who makes it, tidies it up a little bit, and then it'll be available on the Laramie County Extension website. And Albert, definitely you'll get a, a copy of this for sure. So anyway, I wanna thank everybody for joining us for the first program for the Wyoming Bee College Conference mini series. <laughs> and I wish everybody a good night. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. I'm not sure how to turn it off. It's on my end here. Um, yeah, everybody have a great night. Be safe, be careful out there. That was easy. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, Albert, thank you again for taking time out of your evening and to do this and I sure appreciate it. Stay warm up there in Saskatoon. Okay. Take Good care. Good night, all. Bye-bye.